Steve? No, it's good. Just uh meeting is now streaming live on YouTube. Yep. So I'm gonna start it. I'm gonna start it on YouTube and then I'm gonna share it out to everywhere else. So unfortunately it's gonna be a different URL. But just tell everybody. Okay. okay. It's live. What's happening? Everybody here? We have Stephen Wright. I think I don't know how it works in the magic boxes on this this platform that we're using, but Stephen Wright under me from LaGrange, Illinois. Welcome, Stephen. He's the one keeping us on. We fell apart earlier, so thank you, Stephen. And then on top yeah. top uh, left hand corner, I believe, would be my buddy, trumpet player, and uh, wonderful person, and ex Maynard valet Keith Fiala. What's up, Keith? How you doing? Good. Good to see you. And last but not least, our friend from Minnesota, eh? Hey. Uh, one, hey, wonderful Stop. trumpet player also, human being, <laughs> now, a wonderful teacher, and he has a Maynard Ferguson poster behind him. So Frankie Abrahamson, Frank Abrahamson, what's up? Hey, Carl. Welcome, gentlemen. How's everybody? Good. Mm -hmm. Honored to be here. Thank you. Sorry for the glitches. We have a we had a little restream issue, and it wasn't restreaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve. So yeah. So so this is a little bit different. Sorry, I'm I'm scrambling a little bit, guys, because uh, I have to watch the chat a little bit different. Um, I'm sharing everything out onto Facebook now. So let's, let's give everybody a minute to, to join. Um, and, uh, and we'll see, <clears throat> we'll see if we can get a little bit, uh, a little bit better of a, of a situation going on here. A situation. I like that a situation. Well, cool. Well, tonight is the knowledge he has. Wow. Yeah. He's, you know, he's smart, you know, not, you know, I noticed not all people that wear glasses are smart, but you two are really smart with the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't need them. I just wear them to try to boost my IQ a few points. It doesn't work at all. You know, man, it's funny because now I can't see anything close without glasses. And it, I'm like, I, I don't know what happened, but it's like a light switch. I'm like, anything up close, I'm like, I need glasses. It's hysterical, oh, wow. which is cool, whatever. But anyway, so welcome, guys. Tonight is our show. I know we had some issues earlier, but tonight is the MF Trumpet and Valet Hang. And obviously, all three of us, Keith, Frank, and myself, were on Maynard's band with the dual role. And so we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, we have the Fish Head Gallery, which I know we're coming over from Facebook and YouTube and Steven's streaming everybody. So please keep your questions going. Um, Frank and... Uh, Keith and I and Stephen obviously will answer him as best we can. Of course, I have questions from my friends, but appreciate everybody being here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to jump in. Stephen, are people starting to come over? Can we gonna jump in? Yeah, we're starting. Start we're um, let's let's give it like two more minutes because um, I'm I'm just getting it shared to all the groups and things like that 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 had the link before because it's all right. new. Well, you know so, what? Since, since we're doing that, I'd rather you know I'm gonna wait, wait, wait to give these guys questions too because mm -hmm. that peop, that's important for everybody to hear. But the unimportant things, less important. Well, the less important things I'll talk about next week. We're doing the same thing next Tuesday, like we do every Tuesday. This is episode 51. Next week will be 52. We're looking forward to that. We're gonna have an, we're gonna continue the Maynard continuum of um. There'll be some fun guests, just like this week. We have Maynard fun guests. What we have on roll call is our big daddy, Ed Sargent. He's going to come and hang out with us. We have the wonderful Chip McNeil, wonderful saxophone player and arranger. There might be a hang with Tom Garling, a wonderful trombone player and arranger. And there might even be a, a Ferguson fight, a Ferguson sighting. We, we're not sure yet. we got to totally confirm him. But Pete Ferguson, another trumpet player valet, said he's going to try to make it next week. We have to figure out if we can actually get it together. So that will be next week. And then a little uh, announcement, too. The following week after that, uh, May 11th, um, we're taking a night off. I'm actually getting hernia surgery. Ah. I was lifting something heavy and for the last three years, and it's ugly. So trumpet, if the trumpet players are on here, um, I've talked to a few few gentlemen that have had it, um, being a trumpet player, and I'm going to be very vocal about it because I think we all have to deal with that, especially playing from your diaphragm. It's a 
it's umbilical hernia. Um, so I've seen a lot of doctors and they all tell me I'm crazy and I have gray hair and I'm fat. So between those two things, fix me. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to be down for the count for a while, but you know, um, we're going to take the 11th off, but any trumpet players have any questions or if you can help me out, you know, it's open forum. So there's no reason to hide. We're all friends here and we hang out. So that's what's going on. And enough about the kind of billboard of what's going on here um, or what's going on in the future. Let's talk about now. So that being said, Stephen, we're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, go ahead and uh, cool. go ahead and do your thing, buddy. And I'll uh, I'll just keep trying to get people moved over. Yeah, we appreciate your patience, everybody. So, uh, you know, Keith Fiala, wonderful trumpet player. Keith, you were you got on the band in 2004, correct? Correct. All right. And before that was Kevin, w w was Kevin Meads, right? Was the valet? Yes. Wonderful Kevin Meads from Alabama, our friend. Killer. Ke Killer. Yeah, we love Killer. And, and so, Keith, you did the band for a year. You, you did the valet and trumpet for a year. You left in uh, 05, correct? I did. Uh, at the very, very tail end of 04, um, my stepdad started getting pretty bad health-wise. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That's not easy. We all, we all, uh, been, well, not all of us have been there, but yeah, it's, I remember. And uh, you took care of business, bro. So, uh, you know. You were, Maynard, Maynard loved having you on the band and you guys had a great relationship and uh, I know uh, I know you had a good time be out there also so we appreciate you coming and, and, and also being there for Maynard and your stepfather it was it was an honor definitely an honor yes sir cool so and, uh, and Frankie you joined um, in 1998 April, uh, April. okay and there'll Chester be a test. Craftsman's Guild yeah there'll be a test on this later everybody so you know, if you know Frankie's date, everybody gets a everybody gets a reward. <laughs> what date was it again? April fifteenth. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I yeah, I was I joined in. Uh, was it the winter of ninety three? I think it was the winter of ninety three. Well, no, winter of ninety two. Winter of ninety two. Uh, I can't keep up either 92 or 93 the winter not December 92 anyway so I remember Frankie came on and you replaced wonderful trumpet player and valet Jay Roberts um correct and you did the band for uh uh a uh, half a year or a year how, how long were almost, you on the band? A year, almost a year and a half I left a year and a half. Um, okay. yeah okay. I, I my last gigs were like right right before very end of, very end of July in 99 you know my mom was in poor health and yeah. So I decided it would be best to leave the band. It was a hard choice, you know? Sure. And so I thought about over a month and then, uh, yeah, she passed away a year later. So it, in hindsight, you know, it was, it was the right choice, even though, man, you know, God, it was hard because yeah. I love Maynard, but I love my mom more, you know? Sure. So, no, yeah. it's understandable. And so family's yeah. first. And uh, it is. Maynard it is. Would, would say that. So, and yeah, again, man. Maynard love, you know, you guys were very, for me being a valet on a band for on and off for five, uh, well, I guess from 03 to 97, um, I mean, from, from 92 to 97, on and off, uh, I got to see a lot of people interact with Maynard. And I loved how Maynard loved you guys. He felt comfortable with you guys. And that's 90% of the gig, as you guys know. You know, Maynard, and Maynard was very easy to get along with. Oh, it's you know, amazing. But at the same token, you know, you guys have to have the he same headspace and kind of know what he wants before he asks for it. And right. both you guys had that concept as well as Keith, uh, Kevin Meads too. Kevin had that and Jay had it too. But I've seen some guys that necessarily didn't understand that right away. So, you know, um, but enough, you know, is, it, we love Maynard. It's not going to be a Maynard fest, but I'm going to throw two questions. Uh, one question for both of you guys right away. You guys are trumpet players. You're musicians. What uh, uh, start started up, Keith? What got you start? What got you into playing trumpet? Who got you started, and how how that happen? Uh, my uncle, he, who was my first trumpet teacher, he handed me three albums. One was Maynard. Okay. One was Earth, Wind, and Fire. One was Tower of Power. Nice. And that kind of that kind of clinched it, you know. So, yeah. And so I, I grew up knowing who Maynard was far before I ever knew Rolling Stones or. or <laughs> <laughs> I knew more about Maynard than I did anybody. Beautiful. Yeah. So that, your uncle was, was either you have to thank him or punch him. 
<laughs> for playing oh. trumpet. Yeah, I know. That's cool. Frank, how did, how did it happen for you, man? What, what got you interested well, in playing? I think I'm older than all you guys. So I'm actually, I grew up in an era when you turn on the TV and you'd see live orchestras. And I was a sports guy growing up, but I had older sister, Kathy, uh, who's watching tonight out in Seattle. She was a flight attendant, but she played cornet in the high school marching band and uh, worked in a record store. And she brought home some records and they were like Al Hurt. I had Al Hurt records. I still have the vinyl records. And I got that sound in my head and I just started playing her, uh, her cornet. But, you know, I never took a, uh, I never took a formal lesson until I was 18. But I always played in the bands, you know, the, there was so much great music in the 60s and 70s. It was everywhere. Sure. So I, I just kind of it was part of the culture, you know, and and uh, but yeah, I didn't really know no other musicians, in my family, just my sister. And then uh, I just kind of got bit by the music bug in the mid 70s, late 70s, like a lot of other people did. Cool. So I think I was more with me just growing up in the year I grew up in. You know, okay. I'm a little older than all you guys. So it was there's so much good music back then. It's amazing, you know. Yeah. I feel so, bad for the kids now. I mean, when you look at instrumental music or lack thereof, oh God. it's pretty, 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 pretty sad. When I actually about- feel like now that I'm teaching a lot of kids, I have a lot of uh, uh, kids that are maybe, um, you know, in their teenage years and just turning them on to, you know, great music. You know, sure. when, when they study an instrument, it opens up their ears. Yeah. to other music than they otherwise might hear you know and their mind too you know, i exactly. think it really, i think it definitely helps out both left and right brain yeah i think <laughs> i only have a left brain but <laughs> i think jamie abersall not- said something once i agree with he said if if music appreciation was taught in all schools from kindergarten through uh grade 12 the people would demand music of a higher quality than what wow. they're being fed and that doesn't mean everyone has to be into jazz it just means okay. have your ears you know, and your brain open to other stuff than what you're, you know, going to, and I think that's what happened with, with me, you know? Beautiful. So, yeah. Honestly, that's a great answer, man. And so that being said, Keith, you touched on it. So what gave you the next, and it's moving to our next question. What gave you that Maynard bug? how do you get into Maynard? Obviously your uncle gave you the pivotal tower power. Oh yeah. Maynard and uh, the earth, wind and fire, you said. Wind fire, yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so you're, you're young. Yeah. What was the, how that relation, you have the records and they're, what a great, I love how they're totally, you know, different genres, but still kind of funky. And, you know, how did, wh- what was the kinship into, into the next Maynard realm for you? Does that make oh, sense? That question? Yeah, it does. Um, I was given for Christmas, actually, the new vintage album. Oh, cool. I was pretty young. I was only like eight or nine years old. So when I put it on, I put it on at night and it would freak me out because it was just kind of dark, you know, <laughs> that ethereal sound to it. Um, so I, I would always kind of put that album on, maybe not so much at night. Um, and then I got Conquistador and I got a few others. And then he came to uh, the town that I grew up in, Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. And I saw him live in, I, I want to say, February of 82. There it is. And man, I was transformed. Change, change your life, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I was hooked, and so I, in fact, I've still got the cassette. I had I had this big parka on, and I stuffed the cassette player inside my parka, and sitting on my lap, I had it there. And then to leave, we had it stuffed back in you know my parka. <laughs> there so it is. So yeah, that was the uh, that was the uh, the spark that really ignited hearing them live. Uh, you know, and, and it's crazy because next week we're coming on 15 years of not having Maynard in our life, right? It's 15 years since we haven't seen uh, seen um, Maynard physically. And I tell, I have, you know, we all, and I think all you guys have seen this now because it just time marches on. There's children who are, you know, 15 years old uh, or 14 or 16 that haven't heard Maynard sound live. Right. And, you can't, you know, you can, you listen to it on a record. Same thing. I talked with John Faz a lot and it was the same thing. Louis Armstrong sound, you know, wow. hearing it live, you know, one, you know, having one microphone in a room with Louis Armstrong and the hot fives and those recordings and his sound penetrating and being big as a house. And then, you know, you go down, you know, 30 years or 40 years later and you hear Maynard's sound, you know, just monstrous. It totally changes your whole mentality. I think, I mean, I oh, wish these kids got to hear him, you know? Yeah, no. I mean, it, it was transformational seeing him live versus hearing him on an album. I mean, it was it's still just amazing to put something on yeah. and hear it. Sure. But still in the same room where he's blaring at you. 
Wow. There's no you know, I, yeah, Frank, go, man. I've, I've got, no, I just got to say, I never in a million years, I went and heard Maynard when I was 18, 19, and I never in a million years envisioned myself being on the band ever. And I just thought, no way, man. I thought maybe, maybe I can get, you know, fourth trumpet on Buddy Rich or Woody Herman's band or something. And then they both died in 87. And uh, so, you know, I mean, I'm Larry Foyan. I owe, I owe everything to Larry Foyan. He got on the band, recommended me. I was already in my late thirties and my playing was getting better. And, you know, Larry recommended me and, uh, you know, Ed Sargent hired me, but I know I didn't get on. Well, let's Carl. go back. You go, let's go back. I'm going to interrupt you. You got to go yeah, back yeah. because that you're going into my next, you know, we got go ahead. what, what, so you've seen it because this is important for the younger people. You're 18 years old. You go hear Maynard. Was that right. the spark? You said, I don't want to, were you scared of being on Maynard's band? Cause it scared the shit out of me. Hearing oh, that trumpet I section. Remember, I, still remember, I, like, oh. I still remember my first night when they played the walk on, you know, cause Larry had told me the first night when you're on there and they do blue bird land. No, I'm talking know. about when you're 18. When you're young, oh, God, you know, forget what? about because forget about getting on a band now. When you're when you're, I want this for your students. I just thought this guy was from another planet. Like you know, I I was like, how is that even possible? You know, and this was his band. This was in 1977. You know, so okay. this is the Rocky era. Yeah, this was Stan and and, uh, and oh my Peter God. Erskine. And you know, drums. Maynard. Both Maynard told me this, and Joe oh, Mazzello. Jones Maynard well. told me there were, that, that the, the prom ballroom in St. Paul, Minnesota was like their favorite place to play. Joe told me when we were at Maynard's memorial service, I was riding with Frank Green and his dad in the car and Joe Mazzello. And they, he told me that it was like their favorite place to play in the whole country. And Maynard said, yeah, that place. And he said there was some teacher's college in Pennsylvania. But they people would line up at two in the clock in the afternoon to get tickets. Yeah. Uh yeah, at the old, it's now it's a car, like it's like a car repair place. They tore it down, but it was, it was, they'd open the doors and people would just, uh, cause it was like, you know, first come first serve seating. People would just rush in. It was a different era, you know, late seventies. So, um, yeah. that was just amazing. I'm so glad I, I, I'm so glad I grew up in that, in that period of time, you know? Sure. So will you, so the question that it's great that, that you hit that because it's wonderful. I mean, cause the band is very to me when you're younger i mean hearing this it's very intimidating you know hearing uh full you know time. them full playing time. the technique and the, and the power just not just of maynard the band itself was just such a force oh to be reckoned with and so you know i i i wish there were bands around i mean you, know, you still got winton got a toro you know you have guys going out and playing which is wonderful but i love having when you have a big brass section you see people's faces when you're young and you're doing colleges and, and, and high schools and people get right into it so you know, you went forward on a question, which I'm, I love, Frank, and we're going to mo move on. So so now, Larry Foyne, you're friends with Larry. Larry's a great triple player, was on the band. I got to spend some time with Larry, and Scott Inglebright was one of the sections I got to play with. And so he recommended you. That's how you got on Maynard's band, right, Frank? Yeah, but I, I know that, you know, I know that um, you, you know, Ed, obviously he had had to discuss it with you and Frank Green, and you guys were on there. So thank you to you and Ed or whoever it was guys that you know let me on you know and you know i think the good thing that really helped me before that is i was playing full time every night with another big band i was on the road i wasn't practicing so before i went on the band actually i flew home from pittsburgh uh gave notice on this band the russ morgan band on a friday i haven't heard that name in all ages the russ morgan yeah, band. yeah. and i was playing with daryl exity who's jim manley's best friend Okay. plays plays at jim's level he's amazing and the other guy in the in the section was tom baker who was the last lead player with kenton okay. and also played lead twice with buddy rich so i went from playing with those guys one week to you and frank green the next week sorry and about I, that <laughs> no man i don't think i could have done it if i just been practicing in my basement eight hours a day so i went from playing in a really good trumpet section one week to a, a great section the next week you know it, oh, cool. it made the trans plus i had the road chops you know i was used to being on a bus Wow. eating in a restaurant you know all that stuff sure you know cool so no, that's I, great yeah it worked out yeah no it worked out so keith how, how did so you got the bug uh i know you when i first met you too and you came on the band you're doing a lot of funk and uh, i call it jobbing work and a lot yeah. of clubs and stuff like that um so explain to us how you got on maynard's band and how, how that whole thing happened if you don't mind um, it, it had always been a dream, but it seemed like, like what Frank said, kind of just a distant thing that would never happen. Okay. Um, and I'm, I was good friends with a sax player in Austin who knew Reggie. And, who was the sax player? Uh, you know him? Carlos Sosa. 
Oh, Carlos. Yeah, from Austin. Yeah, I love Carlos. Yeah. We were talking one night, and he said, you know, I know Reggie. And I said, you do? And he goes, yeah, you ought to put together something, and let's let's just see what happens. And lo and behold, I did. I put something together, and a month later, Reggie's calling me. And I'm wow. like, you're kidding. You got the right number? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I took the gig, and yeah, it was it was amazing. Wow. Right I didn't on. realize I didn't realize the Carlos thing was was that Carlos, you know, um, and Reggie, Carlos, Reggie and Fernie Cas, 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 Castillo, right? Yeah. And then we had, Rob, uh, yep. And what was <laughs> they, had the name, they still have the name for the section. I can't remember. Great mm -hmm. Sworn session. Oh, yeah. Groove line horns. There you go. Jason Mraz, you know, Car, you know, very into you know, going out. Reggie was one of our guests uh, last season. He came on. But um, yeah. And. Uh, okay, so there's there there's the story. See, I love having my friends on. I think I know them, but I always learn something. That's why I like doing like. I'm sorry, I, I like to dissect everything. It's yeah. it's interesting, man. It, it's kind of cool <clears throat> to remember sh stuff like this. I almost cursed. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you know what? So I'm gonna hit you with one more, and then we'll check in with the fish heads um, and Stephen. So now we're talking musically. You know, you're coming in as a trumpet player, but also. Um, this was always like it was dreaded as a, as a bad word or somebody who was like, oh, well, you know, um, oh, he's just a valet. He can't play. You guys were good players. And so I remember also when I came on a band, you know, it was like, hey, will you take care of valet? And a lot of people, I'm just going to refresh a lot of people's memory or just tell the tale of a valet is a very fancy word for a personal assistant. It was an old band, big band word. Uh, you know, Glenn Miller, all these guys had valets back in the day, Kenton. Um, so I was, you know, Maynard needed somebody to take care of his day to day personal assistant, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was a, I, I would never change. I, I loved doing the gig. I got to learn more from Maynard in, in my years doing that than playing on the band. And I learned a hell of a lot playing on a band. So, what did you guys know, um, Keith? I'll throw it to you. What did you know about the valet position, and how did you uh, were you intimidated by that? Uh, because it was, you know, you have two gigs playing trumpet and valet. How that, how um, that transcend for you? I mean, I had spoken to Ed Sargent, Big Daddy, um, just before I came out, and he kind of gave me the whole, you know, the whole breakdown. Um, and I wasn't so much intimidated by the valet thing because I knew I could, you know, I was, I was going to be there. I was going to do the best I could for Maynard. Mm -hmm. um, what intimidated me was playing with you guys. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, I went from a funk and R&B band where I memorized the music to, you want me to play what? Yeah. <laughs> so like sections and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first gig, I was just terrified. <laughs> it was all I could do to get air through the horn, you know. Yeah, but I remember you're also very humble, though, too. I remember you, you know, I think you're also hard on yourself, but also at the same time, I remember you coming off the stand and we were taught. I remember it was a high school, if I remember, and we sat in the cafeteria at the high school. In Maine. If, where was it? Somewhere in Maine. Wow. Okay. Was it with the Mike Kaiser? Remember that guy, Mike Kaiser? He he was a Maine. He used to have us. He was a trumpet player and collector, and he loved Maynard. And I whenever. You guys remember him? He was cool. I, I remember him. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. He was yeah. a good dude, man. It might have been a Mike Kaiser uh, sponsored gig. He had a lot of stuff up in Maine. We'll ask Big Daddy about him. But um, I remember you, you know, being a little shell shocked. I'm like, dude, just do your thing, man. And it came around. Yeah. Thanks. Man. No, you came. I mean, hey, man, it's, you know, for me, and I, I, I maybe correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, multitasking, playing, in a big band or a small trumpet session, smaller trumpet session, and then multitasking Maynard's needs, um, you know, you didn't want to let the guy down, obviously, and you didn't want to let the band members down. So it was a stressful time, but, you know, you guys rose to it, man. And I, I really appreciated your your kindness, your honesty, your help, your support. I mean, yeah. you know, you were, you were one of the guys that I turned to because – Otherwise, I was just kind of out swimming in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have let you sink, bro. We wouldn't have let you sink. We all have life jackets. I had life jackets. John, John Owens and Joey Tartell um, were my life jackets, and Tom Garling, and you know, so we all we all are very fortunate to have those life jackets. Now, Frank, same question, man. How how did you? So you, you're playing with Russ Morgan. You're playing with trumpet players and and sections, but now the valet thing. 
Um, I, I wasn't intimidated by I wasn't intimidated by the physical demands of the gig, and I I knew that um, you know Larry had told me, you know, just don't. I mean, because I was a little older, well, quite a bit older. I wasn't going to be the guy coming up to Maynard and asking him, you know, what mouthpiece and horn he played on the sessions in the fifties. So right away, Maynard was, you know, comfortable with me because I just wanted to do the gig and I just figured, okay, great. I'm going to play third trumpet, you know, but when I got on the band and this is what I wanted to talk to you about, I told you earlier, the first night on the band, I'll never forget it. We're in Pittsburgh at Manchester craftsman's guild (laughs) and Ed called the whole band together. And this was the veteran band. These are all the guys, you know, Sal Giorgiani, Frank Green, Matt (laughs) Wallace. Matt was my roommate and the band turned (laughs) over after the brass attitude album. And most of the guys left because they'd been there for years, but I, I can still, I can see it right now. Ed called the band together the first night before I'd ever played a note. And Ed was kind of nervous. And and he said, guys, he said, I can't remember his exact words, but Maynard had had some dental work done over the over the break. And I remember when I met him and he smiled, his teeth looked different. And they capped, they did something with his teeth. And I and he still sounded great, but I, I remember we were passing parts around. You remember yeah. that, right? You know, I he wasn't able to hit his notes that I'm, and yeah. For like yeah, two now, weeks. Yeah, it, go ahead, man. No, no, man. You just totally blew my mind because I, I, not, I, I wouldn't have, re- I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't have pulled that story out because it's so deep in my head. But it's surreal, I remember, man. and they were, it was, it was a recording. They wanted a video and recording. It was when they just finished the, the Manchester. That was a newer place at that point. They yeah. put a whole bunch of money into that joint. I remember. Yeah, it was you know we just did the record Brass Attitudes and. I think wasn't that day or week Maynard was in the chair, the dentist chair that week. Yeah, 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 yeah. He went, yeah, and and um, it was wild, man. I mean, before he went and had the, and went and had his teeth put back the way they were. I remember cleaning blood off Maynard's mouthpieces. Yep. In in the room, and and as and I swear to God, I'm not exaggerating. Maynard was laughing about it. Yeah. And I, I really I thought, smashed it home. <laughs> I was thinking, I thought about the James Bond movies where right before the guy goes, okay, Mr. Bond, this is it. And, you know, he, he cracks a joke. I thought, here's Maynard cracking, you know, making jokes about, you know, he's having yeah. some, but they put his teeth back and there it all was. came right back, man. So well, he was, you know, the Kentucky. Talk, you, uh, any I'm of the sorry. rest of us would have been freaking out, you know. Yeah, man, I got you. Yeah, for peace. Um, and Maynard got up. We had done an all nighter on the bus, and he got up and he had this lump on his right side. You remember that? Um, so we wow. called Steve Friedman, and I drove him to St. Louis, and he had, geez, I want to say, like four or five nerves that they killed because they did a root canal. Yep. Wow. Spent the night in St. Louis, drove back. We played a show that next night, and he yep. played the loudest above double c i've ever heard in my life he was a freak what wow. a freak he was a freak he Insane. went steve steve uh shankman steve was the shankman. manager at that point and i remember steve had that dentist who actually was a trumpet player wasn't a, he knew about maynard very well right. and also this was i think the same story that he didn't let the dentist put novocaine into his gums no oh my God. So he sat in that chair and did his his Osai Roms and did his whole thing. And I remember, right? I mean, because you, yeah. you were there. I mean, yeah, yeah. I remember you telling me, dude, he, he was totally no Novocaine or nothing, bro. I'm like, nothing. I mean, he went in and I mean, no screaming, no nothing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, this can't be happening, you know, because he said, now, nah, because he told, he told the dentist as the dentist came and got him, he's like, no Novocaine. Let's do this and let's do it right. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, yeah. huh? Knock me over the head with a hammer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Put me out of my misery. <laughs> yeah, man. And you're right. And you're right. He came back and he slayed it. We we're like, dude, oh. he was superhuman with that. With yeah, that. Carl. And right after the thing with Maynard, where they put his teeth back of St. Louis, right after that, we did the Blue Note for his 70th birthday. Remember the 70th birthday week with uh, yeah. Holy Crystal and all those people and Greg Gisbert and Pete Olstead. All those guys came and said, I just heard from Pete the other day, man. Oh, cool. I uh, just got to Yeah, I, I played with Pete on, uh, believe it or not, Russ Morgan Band at the Rainbow Room in New York City back in the 80s. Way nice. back. Yeah, yeah. Man. Pete and I, Pete and I go way back, man. Yeah. So, um, 
but yeah, man. And then after that was the Brass Attitude album. So it was it was crazy when I look back when I look back at that period and that first tour. That was well. Speaking about looking back, Frank, looking back, were you happy and glad that you did both the valet and trumpet gig? And the same question. Oh, for Keith Adolfo for said to me one night, and I knew this. And Adolfo said, you know, and I wasn't Frank on the band, as you know, I was Frankie A, right? Frankie I was Frankie A, baby. A, because Frank. Frank Green, Frank Green was the real Frank. Frank. So I was Frankie well, A. Everybody has a name for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I and Adolfo goes, something. Frankie, he goes, man, he goes, he goes, you get to know Maynard so much better than any of us ever will, you know? And I, he goes, I know you work hard and you're up all the time, but, and I said, yeah, you know, you're right. You know? And I remember a couple times, I remember once in Denver, it was a day off and it was beginning of a tour and I was like separating all the Maynard stuff in his room. You know, he had the adjoining rooms always, right? He'd get the two rooms. Yep. With and the telephone cord between the two rooms. Remember the yeah, telephone exactly. cord? Oh, man. The thing about Maynard, I'll always, I'll never forget. And you guys know this as well. After every gig, first thing he would do, you'd be in that other room after he showered, whatever, he'd call Flo. And hi, honey. Yeah, it was amazing. And I just thought, man, these people, they've, they've got, they've got a great, great marriage. You know, every, after every gig. And Maynard comes in there one, I'll never forget it, man. He, and he did it more than once. I mean, not every week, but he comes in there and he goes, hey, man, here. And he goes, uh, hands me a menu. And I go, what's this? And he goes, he goes, I'm ordering from room service. Get anything you want, you know. Yep. And he, of course, always get filet mignon and I would get, you know, whatever. And it would be a day off and I'm sitting there in the hotel. Hanging with him. Have, yeah. And, he and was just, our friend. He was our friend. We oh, had that yeah, and was relationship. Thinking, and I was just thinking, man, this is just. Where else? Where else in the world would I rather be? What else would I rather be doing right now? Nothing, you know, this is it, man. I, my favorite is, you know, show up to his room on a day off and he'd be in his uh, white t-shirt and underwear and, you know, and, and getting ready and, and ah, ah, I'm going to have some lunch and dinner. Ah, you want to order something and I watch hockey, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he, you know, he'd lay flat on his belly and he'd watch hockey with the TV. I and love I, it. All right. You know, we'd hang yeah. out. You know, it was crazy. I, we were privileged guys because I know, we man. had that window open and a lot of kids don't know man no cell phones you know he would have his he'd get a 25 foot extension cord for his phone right remember. yeah and he walked through and, and, and he'd walk through the room with his phone it was like the original cell phone with a cable on it <laughs> <laughs> so keith uh, to talk to us man the same question i mean obviously i, I think we all own the answer but uh, were you happier and and glad that you did both gigs or now looking back great for the world of me i mean nothing there's nothing that would make me go back and say oh i, I couldn't do that again i loved it every second of it he <laughs> about two or three weeks into the gig he called the hotel room and patrick was my roommate patrick, patrick hessian trumpet player yep. um patrick answered the phone and he looks at he goes man it's for you and i'm like it is he goes yeah it's the boss and i said oh okay and boss goes yeah yeah, Fiona, get up here now. <laughs> yeah. Hangs up the phone. Like, and I'm like, oh, oh God, man. what, what did I, I lose? What did you lose? Exactly. I'm start, I go back and I'm starting to think, okay, what did I not set out? What did I not do? Yeah. I go and I do the knock on the door, the special knock. And <laughs> he answers the white t shirt and the underwear. He goes, yeah, come on, man, come on. I go in and it's Stockton and a couple other guys sitting there and they're drinking beers and they're watching hockey. <laughs> and I'm like, you're not going to fire me? <laughs> Am I safe? <laughs> exactly. Cheeseburgers and chicken wings. And it was, it was just, it was awesome. And that memory will stick with me forever. Yeah, man. We're oh, lucky, beautiful. man. Yeah. Yep. And well, you're speaking, lucky. Of, speaking of losing something, it reminds me about, I'd been on the band now for almost a year. So it was pretty, you know, things were pretty smooth. But I remember the one time I made a, I, I made a mistake, and I'm sure I made more than one. But I remember one time we were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We played a gig in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then we had a hit and run to Wyoming. Long hit and run. Once you got to Wyoming, Maynard Sai Baba picture. I'd left it. I'd left it on top of the TV, oh, wow. and, uh, in Milwaukee. And I was like, "Oh, Maynard, I'm so sorry." He was totally cool about it, man. Wow. He was. He, yeah, he was like, man, I, I I felt really bad about it, man. It's the only time I I missed packing something up. Only time, really? Damn, yeah. Frank. You sure no, about that? <laughs> it's the only time I remember. All the stuff he had, you one thing you lost. Come on, Frank. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I probably did. 
More seven. Bags. At one time, I counted seven Toomey bags. Uh, well, you know, the big Toomeys, wow. where, where, where now you can't fly with them because the bag weighs 25 pounds. He had, when I, <laughs> Carl, when I did the load in, when I did the load in, in, in April of 98, I mean, he had seven suitcases in. There were seven suitcases, yeah. like 25 Hawaiian shirts, uh-huh. you know. Did you guys, you know? were you guys hip to, did you have the road case for the boom box at that point? No, did we get oh, rid of it. Oh yeah, that sat underneath the bus. I never, yeah. I never really. When I first uh, joined, man, that thing weighed like 110 pounds. I think that's yeah, partially no, why I have a hernia never, now. <laughs> the one thing I always loved to Maynard is I always had my eye. I said, man, man, I loved his uh, Walt Johnson single case, the tie dye one. Remember that? Yeah. yeah, I do. Yeah, he's making them again. Walt's starting to make them. I heard he's right. Yep. You yeah. speak to Walt a lot, Keith, don't you? Or he's out by you. Walt's back up and running, man. He sounds great, and he's he's making faces again. Thank goodness. Cool. Right after I joined the band, I got a Walt Johnson single case. Daryl Exidy, you know, uh, Jim's friend, uh, gave it to me. So that's what I used the whole time I was on the band was a Walt Johnson single case. We're great. Yeah, so you know, yeah, Walt's a great guy, and uh, 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 those are great stories, man. It brings a lot, a lot back in, in 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 my memory. I'm sure it does to you guys too. Before we open up to other questions too, I'm just gonna a ni- nice other seg- segue is, um, and. I'll just throw it out there. So you did the valet, Keith, you did the valet gig, you played trumpet. I imagine that was almost prerequisite now for kind of what you're doing with your gig now. So if you guys are not aware, Keith Fiala is with a, the wonderful Arturo Sandoval, and you play a little bit when need be. Um, and also you're his tour manager. What's the exact uh, tour uh I, he calls me his road manager, the tour manager. Uh, I am whatever he needs me to do in that particular moment. Um, not like Maynard because I don't, I don't have to lug in all of the suitcases and, you know, sure. the beer and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I think what my gig for him is when we're on the road, when we were on the road, yeah. is to try to make his life easier. 100% easy. Yeah. So all he has to do is think about, okay, the gig is here at this time. Sound check is taken care of. The stage is set up. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. If anything pops up with the hotels, if anything pops up with the flights, you know, he's got someone to, he'll, you know, he knows I'll, I'll do the best I can to take care of it, or at least start facilitating phone calls to take care of it. Yeah, man. Yeah. And that you're right. Uh, the mayor thing was, it was really good training to teach me that. Um, and I got to say, man, to be, to be with Arturo, it's equal to, being with Maynard, it, it's a blessing. Yeah, he's a good guy. Good for you. Never tell you. Good for you, Keith. Thanks, man. Awesome. You did a great job, man. Yeah, no. Post, man, you sounds great. All this, yeah, you Thank sound you. great, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, man. So, I would imagine that you know the Maynard was a great stepping stone for you in your career. And so, so Frank, I know you're teaching a lot. Um, mm-hmm. What's your what? what, what I know you've done a lot of, you know, after that you went to Branson after Maynard's band and your mom mm-hmm. to carry your mom, right? You, mm-hmm. So you jobbed in Branson for years. Yeah. Um, how did, how yeah. did, how did the gig set you up for the future? You know, I mean, the thing about when I look back on it now, I mean, I first did Branson in 93. I was actually out of playing. This is really kind of strange. I was completely out of music from 1989 to 93. Okay. Which is really weird. I worked in a hospital. Um, and then I made a trip out to the West Coast with my mom just for to relax. And I'd started practicing again. I didn't touch my horn for almost two years, which I know is not the way. That's not how you get on Maynard Ferguson's band by not playing for a couple. That, but that's what I did. And um, and so when I was out there, I'd started practicing again. And I knew the band leader for Wayne Newton. And I want to get in to see the show. And I said, hey, um, can you get us in? We didn't want to pay 100 bucks for a ticket. You know? So he got me in and the, they were taking the show to Branson, Missouri. And he said, do you want to join the band? And the rest is history. And I did that in 93 and then uh, did some rural bands and then met Larry. And it was just for 15 years, I made a living from like 93 up until about, you know, what, 2010? I pretty much made a full-time living playing trumpet. What really hurt everything was the uh, the first financial the financial meltdown in 2008 2009. Yeah, that was tough, man. Yeah. I even I'm all in all I was like eighty thousand dollars in debt, pretty embarrassing. 
And uh, I went out on cruise ships all of 2009 and really okay. until I could sell my house down in Branson. And okay. um, yeah, man, I went through some, they, that saved my butt. You know, okay. I went out on princess cruises. I know Scooter did some ships too for a while. Sure. So I always But, but your experiences, you know, we know you were a jobbing musician, but your experiences after com coming out of that band did, I'm, I'm sure, you learned so much as far as humility and uh, not that you had, I'm sure you had humility before, but I, I really think a lot of the guys have been Drew Maynard's band, especially the position that we were, you know, the, I call it the Ed Sargent position. Ed was, the, right. you know, one of the quintessential valets and turned his life into, you know, road manager, tour manager, who's right. went on with Joan Jett and many acts and you know, drumstick right. companies. And, you know, uh, you know, everybody has a story. So how did that kind of lay for you, you know, I mean, obviously you humil humility enough to have, I'm going to go make money, sell my house and go on a cruise ship. You have to get along with people. I mean, yeah. that's a whole gig. I, I could do a whole story with you and Frank no, Green I, on cruise I ships. When I played with Maynard, I knew as far as an experience as a trumpet player, when I was playing with Maynard, I knew. I thought, you know, as far as having an experience, you're never going to top this. You know, even if you, I was doing studios in, you know, L.A. or playing in stuff in New York, which I didn't do, by the way. You know, I played in L.A. and New York a lot with different road bands. But I just thought, man, to be up there with Maynard, I, I would think was the greatest experience you could ever have. And the funny thing is, as the years go by, it gets the memories of it get sweeter all the time. <laughs> you know that? With each That's year. what I want to hear. I love hearing. Oh no, man! Things. Yeah, no. Every cool. day, every day. I think That's why I'm priming you, baby. Come on. Maynard, Maynard could have been the biggest jerk in the world and gotten away with it if he wanted to, yep. because of how great he was. But he was the nicest cat I ever worked for. There you go. He was the greatest guy, man. And I've only met a couple of people in my life that were like that. You know, Mr. Adam, my trumpet teacher. Bill Adam. Great. He treated yeah. everyone the same. Didn't matter who you were. And wow. Maynard was that way. I saw him. You know, I was around Maynard for a year and a half, and. After I left the band, every time I came back, you know, maybe half a dozen times, you know, and sometimes Maynard would be close to Branson, Springfield, Missouri. And I was so busy in the theater, I couldn't get up there. But whenever I did, he was like, man, bring did you bring your horn, you know, sit in. And he did yep. introduce. Uh, the last time I saw Maynard was actually at Ronnie Scott's in London. Oh, wow. I was, I was living in Ireland that whole year and playing in, in oh, cool. 2005. With Mary, right? Mary. Mary, Mary man. Yeah. yeah, I still talk to Mary all the time. I go over there. Yeah. I God, man, great, Maynard great, great. and Ed were so cool to me. They were yeah. just, they were just unbelievable, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's other than playing baseball as a kid, those are the greatest memories of my life being on that band. So <laughs> thank you, brother. It's, it's a blessing to find out your superheroes are really nice people. Like, and you know, they say, don't ever meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. Well, that was not true with Maynard. Uh, between, between Maynard and Arturo, I mean, Arturo is like my dad, though. you know, yeah. I tell him everything and he's, I, I can't say how much I love him, you know, yeah. And yeah. Man, I would have, I would have fallen in front of the bus for me. So, and yeah, just like, we're blessed, aren't we? We're very blessed, Keith, you are. know, and Carl, we really are. I mean, Carl, I know this, there's a lot of guys other than me. Uh, yeah. I can only speak for myself that probably deserved the experience I had to be on Maynard Span, but for some reason, you know, God only knows why, you know, I was in the right place at the right time and I got to do that, but I'm eternally grateful, you know? And yeah, uh, yeah Maynard, Maynard was a uh, man, you know, I, you know, he wore the crown well, that's all I can say, right? He was the king of kings. Yeah, you absolutely. Talk about humility, man, when you're that great and you have that kind of humility and you're that nice to everyone. Consistently. Well, yeah, all you can <laughs> do is like, yeah. When he introduced the band, right? Yeah. You know, you know, and he also, I think he had a very keen sense on putting a team around him that a he trusted, that b right. there was a there was a kinship. You know, you look you look at it, Bruce Galloway, you know, uh, the wonderful Ed Sargent for eons, and and, right. and Ed, you know, Ed was responsible for, for me being on the band. Ninety percent of the people that came through that band, Ed was responsible for. Um, you know, personality wise and personnel, um, obviously recommendations, but, you know, and if he, he Maynard was just so good at putting a team together uh, and trusting yeah. and giving you, you know, and, and for me, Billy Joel is the same way, giving enough rope to hang yourself, you know, <laughs> go ahead and do it. Oh, yeah. You know, you want to play solo. Yeah. Play solo. All right. Yeah. You yeah. know, you play tenor sax on this tune. 
yeah, go for it. You know, you know, give me a, you know, oh Carl, you know Maynard, oh yeah, play a little super bone on this. You know, oh you know, turn around, and you want to blow? Okay, yeah, you know, I mean, he gave everybody enough freedom to kind of be you, you know, and right. so and so I, and in in every different aspect of you know, I Brendan the sound man came out, you know, that actually still I think works with Ed Sargent uh, with. Uh, 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 Joan Jett, um, wonderful guy and man, great mixer. Mike Freeland, you look at a whole bunch, you look at the lineage of people that have been through that band, you know, back into the England days and you know, right. back Birdland Dream. I mean, it's just crazy. It's really whatever. I'm going on a tangent. It's funny you should say that because the two people I remember in my in, when Maynard would talk to me, the two people whose names came up most of the time were, were um, Willie Maiden and Ernie and Garside. Was, yep, you know, I just you, would you say that too, Keith? You know, uh, yeah. he spoke very fondly, both of them. I mean, for different reasons, you know, but, but it was, it was, man, it was amazing when Maynard would be in a certain mood and he just start talking. I just said, it was just amazing, man, about life, mainly about life, you know, yeah. not about mouthpieces and trumpets, but just oh, no. fascinating guy, man. Yeah. And that Willie Maynard, actually, he, I actually, I don't know how, actually, I know how I got him. Maynard gave him to me. I had a whole bunch of Willie Maiden charts that uh, originals and I lost a lot of them in the hurricane Sandy when I lost my house. Oh my God. But I saved some of them, but I remember, and I really wrote this and we only played it once, but yeah, here you go. I was like, huh? Are you kidding me? So I was like, you know, I, I still have a couple lead sheets, but I don't have the whole, you know, like I have to score, but whatever. So yeah, he was, and I think a lot of that was because it was his youth too. And, you know, we're, we're kind of right now we're almost we're really reliving our times back in the day. He was, you know, and Ernie was a, such a character, Ernie Garside. I never met him. I never oh, met man. him. He was a character for sure. Woo. Great dude, though. Fun. Yeah. Fun as hell. Where did you meet him, Keith? In, in, in London? Uh, well, no, we did. He didn't he hook us up at some sort of like. Uh, God, I can't remember what it was like a museum, but it was a former some sort of plant or something we had to play out. So we had to drive like in the countryside for two hours. We were in Ronnie America or, or over, over in England. Remember okay. that? We were Ronnie Scott's. Yep. We he was to... always anything over there. He was, in, especially in the UK, he hooked us up, you know, or helped us out. I remember the messy peas and just going, Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <what> the fuck? <laughs> yeah. He was all about it. Oh, Wigan, Wigan jazz fest. Thank you. Thank you. It was Wigan. It was and, and Wigan brought you know it's crazy because uh, Louis Drosdell, uh, Craig, uh, uh, Simon, uh, all the London guys, the wonderful trumpet players. Uh, uh, I'm having a brain freeze, man. Uh, but a lot of those guys were Wigan trumpet players that are now the top guys in London playing all the shows. Steve Sidwell, all those guys you know came through Wigan. Um, uh, Craig Kenny was one of them you know uh simon gardner uh, simon those, gardner yeah all those cats you know went through wigan um you know it was such uh, remember the other guy ah oh. you know there's was, carl is another guy i recommended to ed i knew him from 2005 in ireland ryan quigley and i recommended him yeah, to ed for the band and yeah, goes, great Frank, player. Jazz. yeah back then nobody knew who he was and i told ed i said man this guy is really good yeah he's a monster and of course he never got the chance to play with the band but i knew ryan what because i was over there i was living there that whole that whole year yeah man. Five, and i met ryan and we hung out and holy cow man what a, what a good player and of course yeah, now man. he's doing everything in london you know yeah and his no, dad was, played with maynard he told me recently he said uh Maynard came to Ireland and played a couple gigs because uh, Ryan is from Derry, Ireland, and Maynard put a pickup band together in <laughs> in um, Dublin. And I remember Mary when Mary was on a band, we were hanging out uh, when Mary was hanging out with us. Maynard told me when they did that gig, he said a bunch of the guys showed up for the gig for the rehearsal. And they he, Maynard told me this. He said they've been drinking before the gig, and he was laughing about it, you know. But um, you know, this was. I don't know, seventies or eighties, maybe. Wow, you know, you're just bringing up things and um, Craig Kenny and the Wigan Jazz Festival was Ian Darrington. Remember Ian? He was he was uh, also uh, him and Ernie worked together, but there was a big London contingency, a big UK contingency because I obviously Minard lived over there. All right, so listen, I think we have some 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 people um, coming in. Uh, Stephen, did we lose you? Are you still hanging out? Are you gone? What's up, bro? I'm here. I'm just trying to hold things together. I got the duct tape. 
I got, <laughs> I got, I got some electrical tape. <laughs> some rope. I got, I got scotch tape. <laughs> a glue stick. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, man! I everybody in the chat. I'm, I'm sorry for the late start. It's uh, you got a lot of moving parts, and sometimes some of them just don't want to work, and they're not in your control. So. Um, but we do have a, a nice little chat going on here on, on YouTube. Um, we got uh, <clears throat> some of the guys that, you, that you've been talking about already. We, uh, uh, Ed Sargent is hanging out with us in the chat. Um, uh, another great trumpet player, uh, Eric Miyashiro, is joining us in the, in the chat, hanging with us. What's up? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so they've, uh, we've got a bunch of people. Mike Del Quattro, great trumpet maker. Uh, is here hanging out with us in the chat. Um, so yeah, everybody's just kind of in here. I think our tech issues kind of killed a lot of the questions that were coming in. So, um, but a lot of people are just saying hi, saying how great it is to hear you guys comparing notes. Um, we got our, our hang president Noah, um, <clears throat> saying that he's, he's sad that he, he wasn't alive during the, uh, during the Maynard years. Noah's, uh, as a, a youngster he's a, he's a, he's our president fish head and he's a pianist and a very mm -hmm. talented dude good he good, he's a good cat thanks noah yep one of our hang regulars james skitka uh is commenting on my albums in the background <laughs> i had to take my bonsai trees outside for the sun so i had to put something else in their place so i figured uh, i figured mf horn and carnival and new vintage and stuff like that would be a good uh replacement right keith record new vintage <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um let's see we had uh ed ed chimed in uh you guys were talking about the the dentist um yeah said uh fortunately uh steve shankman's dentist in in uh, st louis took an impression of maine's original teeth um <clears throat> said that S steve played with uh with the band that night after he had the surgery as well oh, wow. um yeah, so Ed was throwing in a little bit of extra, little, little sprinkles on top of the Sunday for us in the in the chat. Thanks, Ed. Um, and, and Ed's actually, uh, you know, he's my kick, kick. He might kick my butt, but uh, he. I spoke to him today, and I, I believe he's gonna ha hang out with us on Maynard's birthday, May fourth, next Tuesday, if we can keep the glue and the duct tape and the tying of, of the restream <laughs> together you know after tonight's thing he ed might say you know what i'm done with you guys but i yeah. believe ed's gonna hang out with us on man's birthday we love you ed if it wasn't for ed we wouldn't be here all love four of us big daddy. Yep. big daddy yeah Take exactly care of everybody uh we got the we got the brazilian trumpet contingent chiming in bruno garcia is here with us I got. Um, let's talk about Bruno a minute. Bruno, every time I yeah. turn around, I see another freaking trumpet player. How many freaking trumpet players do you have doing your JTF thing? It's like everybody's doing. <laughs> I love it. It's like you know, I don't even have to talk about anything because everybody's covering it. It's like you guys hip to the J. It's a uh, is, is the JTF. I was probably the wrong word now. You guys hit I, I don't know the the exact term, but it's it's um Bruno chime in. It's it's a Brazilian yeah. trumpet federation, I believe. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. not the but it's I, I mean, man, I'm every week every couple of days I'm looking at as un, it's like the, I look at it like, oh my god. And everybody's doing ten minute mm -hmm. clinics and, and things for virtual um trumpet thing. I'm supposed to do one I was supposed to do one last week. Um but life gets in the way my hernia got in the way but i'm gonna get it together but yeah no that mm -hmm. thing he's doing is wonderful and if you can check it out and bruno put 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 your um put your uh information in the chat so everybody's hip to yeah. what we're talking about because it's pretty amazing amazing yeah, music on Brazil, man crazy yeah amazing. Bruno's awesome, man. He's, he's great yeah Basically, yeah keith uh, you said that you guys you guys had a uh, a nice hang in uh, in brazil we did we did. <laughs> you Trumpet and barbecue. Well, Maynard? Maynard played in Brazil? I didn't know that. Oh, no, no with the Toro. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, Bruno says it's uh, the Jazz Trumpet Festival, JTF, and it's over 120 trumpet players now. Wow. Are scheduled. Congrats, so. I, I, I'll be the first to say this. I think that's too many trumpet players. <laughs> I think we might finally be able to screw the light bulb in. And, that, and that's coming from me. <laughs> no, that's 
Cool. Oh, cool. It's great, man. It's a beautiful thing. Everybody's getting on board. JTF is yeah. wonderful. Bruno is a great uh, uh, keeper of the flame. So thank you, Bruno, for saying hi. Mm -hmm. Hanging. Yep. Uh, you guys mentioned it's always uh, it's always cool when the people you admire are are cool. Um, Noah had chimed in, kind of reiterating those feelings. Uh, it's nice to see those people that you admire are cool in real life. Um, <clears throat> we have somebody that goes by I Digi Dude. What a great experience to be able to work with all of your heroes, Arturo and Maynard, the best. Um, oh, somebody else that you guys we all know. Uh, Mark Van Cleve is hanging out with us. Uh, good evening, fellas. Nice to hear you guys all comparing notes. I'm cool with Mark, man. He's great. Yeah, Mark is. Oh great. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing player, man. Mike Del Quattro says, yeah, that's way too many trumpet players. Right? I, 120 is like, I can only deal with four, and there's four on right now, and I'm losing my mind. I want to go hang out with, I want to go hang out with a saxophonist for some reason. I don't know. No, yeah. And, and, and Bruno, Bruno says you, we should all feel for him because he has to add subtitles to all the videos. <laughs> God bless you, Bruno. Yeah. So – so yeah, we, we don't have a ton of questions. Like I said, the tech issues kind of killed that, but right. um, you know, everybody's just kind of hanging out and having a good time. Cool. So Love yeah. It. Well, yeah, if so you guys have any pertinent questions or anything, feel free to th throw it out there. Um, we're not going to mm -hmm. do a long, long hang because uh, all our tech issues. Um, so, but if you have anything that you want to ask, be sure to get on that and throw it out in, in the uh, comments, and Stephen will get it to mm -hmm. us. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it right back then if if we're doing a hang. So. You know, we're doing the main thing. So, Keith, give me a Maynard valet story. Maynard valet story. Man, there's a lot of them. Um, but the one yeah. that I, I was going to ask you guys, did he ever try to trick you guys? <laughs> is, a, is a cow have a uh, udders? <laughs> he, would, he would set it up, and he did this to me a couple of times, and ironically, Arturo's done the same thing. Um, I would go and knock on the door and, you know, we have a bus call in like 45 minutes and he's not answering. And uh, the first thing that goes through my head is, oh my God, he's had a heart attack or something's really wrong. And I'll, I'll sit there and knock again, and I'll knock again. And he'll finally go, yeah, my boss, you okay? Yeah. And he'll come and he'll open the door and he's completely dressed and ready to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what he would do is he would take, he would take little silly items, silly little items, and throw them under the bed, and see if I would look under the bed to to get them. Yep. Man, he did that four or five times, and I, I made it a, a mental note: always, always, always check yep. to make sure I'm not a kickboard. You know. Yep. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the best ballet stories I can remember. The fox, man. There was nothing, you know. He was he was the fox for a reason. His nickname, you know, he was slick. He's like, all right, I'm gonna throw this bottle, of, uh, this this thing of Kleenex under the bed and see. But it's my favorite Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> like you test you. Yeah. yeah. His toothpaste under there. Meanwhile, you know, you think you're waking him up. You know, he's oversleeping to leave, and he's already dressed, and he's playing with you. Yeah, the fox is just yeah. Frank, I'm sure you had a couple of instances like that. You give us a valley story. Absolutely. And speaking about sleeping, this one I'll never forget, man. I tell people this one all the time. You know, I've been on the band for a while. And this is one of the nights where the band and Ed went over early to, you know, set up and sound check and have dinner. And it was one of the nights where it was probably like an eight o'clock hit. And Ed came by the room to get Maynard and I, like, a, what, 45 minutes before the gig, right? And I'm in the room with Maynard. And he goes, hey, we're going to play a joke on Ed. And he goes, uh, he goes, hide over there, hide in the bathroom. And Maynard has got all his clothes on. He's all ready to go, man. He's ready to, he's ready for the downbeat. And Maynard climbs into the bed, pulls the sheets over his head. We turn off all the lights. Yeah. And Ed comes up. <laughs> Band knock. It goes, boss, boss. You know, Ed comes in and it's like, you know, half hour before the gig. And Ed's like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> Ed's freaking out. Maynard's sound asleep. And then, of course, like 10 seconds later, Maynard throws open it and pops out and laughing and <laughs> just to get, you know, just to get Ed, just yeah. to get his blood pressure up a bit, man. He Hilarious. liked to keep everybody, he liked to keep everybody laughing, you know. And then That's one other time, I remember Maynard was warming up somewhere in a room and, and uh, you know, one of the notes didn't come out when he was warming up, you know. 
and he goes like this. He goes, I don't want to play high notes tonight. <laughs> I'll never forget that. He only did that once. He goes, he goes, but I don't want to play high notes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'll yeah. never forget that, man. I don't know where it was or when, but I thought, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, I, I'll give you a, I have a couple, I, I mean, we all have a million stories, but two that just popped in my mind, I'll just share because we're, we're sharing. One of them was when I first joined the band, Maynard was sober. Um, and I, the, the winter of 93, he wasn't drinking. Uh, not that he was drinking a lot, but after the gig, ah, we are partaking a little wine, right? So, but sober. And so Ed was like, hey, Maynard's watching it. And Flo was into, you know, hipping Maynard to Martinelli's, which was that non-alcoholic champagne. He was drinking champagne at that time. Right. Uh, you know, so non-alcoholic, it was apple cider. So, um, you know, stock the bus with cases. We you know I go to the store, Ed's like, Martinelli's, all right. So we get Martinelli's and, and uh, yeah, I like a Martinelli's tonight. So we're like a third week into the thing and I'm still green, you know, maybe four weeks into the thing, I'm greener than green, you know, just as far as taking care of Maynard, you know, I'm still trying to do the right thing. And so sneaking Martinelli's and he says, hey, uh, uh, Carl, uh, uh, go get a bottle of wine. I'm like, and I remember Ed saying, hey man, you know, he's, Cool. I'm like, he goes, but don't tell anybody. I'm like, oh no, what do you do? So, like, I go down to the restaurant and I get him a glass, thinking, no, oh, no, a glass. He goes, no, I said wine, get, you know, a bottle. <laughs> I get him the bottle. Right. And so the next day, you know, the garbage, you know, wine's there. So I take the wine, throw it in the garbage, I get it out of the room. So, you know, he's like, get the wine out of the room. The fox is really. He knows everything, but there's another fox on the band, Ed Sargent. Ed goes, oh, did Maynard drink last night? I'm, you know, I'm white as a ghost. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, Maynard drank last night, didn't he? I'm like, yeah. He goes, yeah, he's been drinking for a week. He's been messing with you for a week. <laughs> yeah, not, you know, after the gig, you know, you know, have a taste. Yeah, so that was one. And then my favorite was we're, I was on valet for maybe three years at this point. And Maynard was having some teeth problems or whatever. It was just remember Frank. We played Croce's a lot in San Diego. Yeah, I, I played, played there. there. Times, yeah. yeah, and I I guess uh, this was I guess before you, because Jay came on at that point. Jay, Rock. so I remember yeah. he called me up to the dressing room, which is up. Remember those flights of stairs? It was yeah. way up. You know, run up those flights. You know, uh, oh my God, Jim Croce's wife Ingrid had that club. It was a great yeah. club in San Diego, right downtown San Diego. Oh, yeah, gas lamp. It was beautiful. Yeah. So I run up the stairs and go up there, and he goes, "All right, Carl, you're fired. I never want you ever again. I never want to see you in this room ever again." And I'm like, hey, "He's kidding me." He goes, "You're done. You're you're just done." And Ed's, you know, now Ed, Ed's in there, and Ed's looking at me deadpan. I'm like. Maynard, what I do? He goes, you're practicing way too much and you sound too good. You're not carrying my suitcase. I'm carrying your suitcase. You carry your, you carry your suitcase to the practice room because you've been practicing and now someone's going to take care of you and I'm going to take care of you, uh, meaning you're going to play. I want you to really concentrate on your playing. And we're going to get a valet and you're going up to, at that point, third trumpet book was the valet. And right. so you know, I was like, I was really sweating, but it was such a really meaningful thing. Um, and Ed was a part of it. And it was like, wow, you know, he just had such a great sense of humor with stuff. Oh, man. <sighs> That's a great story. Yeah. Hey, Carl, I've heard the story. You didn't tell it, but I've heard other people tell it that when you joined the band, you were not, you were really young, weren't you? You were like 19, 20 years old. I was the guy who just turned 21. Yeah. And yeah. you weren't playing. And is, is it true that Maynard heard you? down like somewhere to jam session and and like like wow why why isn't carl playing you know yeah ed, ed, ed sergeant told the story just recently and i i i always i always get it wrong but i remember yeah i ed hired me he knew i played you know i sent in tapes and prior to that i was with, very lucky to play with winton marsalis with the lincoln center jazz orchestra on their first tour in 92. In 93 i thought it was starting back up and <clears throat> it was but i wasn't included Winton wanted a music copyist uh, at that time because Winton was writing wonderful uh, uh, music at that time, scoring stuff, and I couldn't copy music. And So anyway, long story short, I was out of a gig, and all of a sudden, the phone rings. It's Ed. He goes, I don't think you want this gig. It's a valet gig, but we know you play, and I'll tell Maynard you play. I'm like, tell me when. 
it's Maynard Ferguson. I love you know, right. That was my my dream since I was five. I wanted to be on Maynard's band. So Ed made that happen. And I show up and I had my horn, just kind of like with Lincoln Center too. I showed up and had my horn, and um, there was a jam and a blues thing. Uh, or a blues hang that night, and I went and played, and Maynard was, I think it was in the lobby at a hotel, and he goes, oh, who's that? Kid sounds good. And he goes, oh, Ed's like, well, that's your valet. He goes, <laughs> oh, shit, why isn't he playing? <laughs> and then, you know, so that was like the second second or third week into it. But I'm glad because Ed was very, you know, as you guys know, there was a lot of intricacies in that valet gig that I really needed to learn. Right. I was young, so I really needed to focus on that. So I focused right. on that for two or three weeks. And I always had, I always, it always, for me, it was always hard to multitask. So I really had to focus on that. And one of the beautiful things that Maynard said to me at Croce's is now just worry about yourself. And yeah. it was like, wow, it was really, a, it was a special, I mean, we all had special times, but so yeah, that's my little story that's on that. Beautiful little Carl. Yeah. Thanks guys. Well, you know, Frank, tell us, tell us. We're on the MF thing. Tell us some band stories. I mean, I remember you trying to surf in California. Uh, we're oh, all on yeah. the beach. Yeah. Out and get... so well. no, you were there. The... Yeah. I was there, man. We're sitting on the beach watching Frankie A surf the waves. Yeah. Tell us some and band stories. I mean, I'm, a good, I'm a good swimmer, but I'm not a good surfer. <laughs> you were a good swimmer that day. <laughs> so, you know, I fell off the board. I, I wasn't going to drown. But, <laughs> but, but, yeah. but yeah, I just didn't have the technique. Yeah, man. That was, God, such great memories, man. You know, hey, I want to ask two of you guys first. I want to ask you a question with a question. Did you when you guys played Ronnie Scott's? Because I only played there once, and we played when I was there. We played for two weeks, and somebody told me nobody ever plays for two weeks at Ronnie's. Did you guys ever do two week runs at Ronnie's? Keith, no, we did. Um, I think it was Wednesday through Sunday, two shows a night. Yeah, but it was only one week. Yeah, because really? when I when I was at Maynard in ninety eight in November ninety eight, I mean, we did so many amazing gigs. But we did two weeks. We we did like a three month tour. It was it was in Carl. Of course, you left the Bandles. Pictures I just sent you today, Carl, were right when you left. You know, right at uh, at the end of the Diane Sure thing. But I remember playing those two weeks at Ronnie Scott's, and then after that we went to Germany. And but man, those Ronnie Scott's gigs. I was just thinking, man, how do you top this? I mean, what what time did the last set in there? Like two thirty in the morning or something? It was late. Oh, it was crazy. And the espressos. Did he send you for espressos? Across no, the street, the never, Italian joint. A uh, place, a cafe. What was the Italian part? I was great. Uh, it's still there. It's, it's unbelievable. Half. Yeah. Oh, it's. Awesome. Yeah. It'd always be me and Maynard and Mary would ride over together because she came over and stayed with me. We'd ride over in those big British cabs, and I was thinking, man, this is why. I, pra I mean, I was just thinking, man, this is this is it. You know, how am I ever going to top this? And you can't, you can't top it. But I mean, as no. far as stories specifically, uh, what do you mean? Just um anything i mean man all i remember about band, maynard, band stories i mean uh, how, how maynard related to the band or how the band related to maynard um traveling you know all, all, all i can ever remember the only time i ever saw maynard a little bit on edge was like when the band completely turned over but then it's like within a week that was he, i don't think i ever saw the guy in a bad mood or mad you know he was just he was superhuman you know, and, and all my memories on that band, like a year and a half, were, were just some of the best memories of my life, you know? And it was a good time in this world. It was before 9-11. It was before all the crazy stuff that's going on now. You know, it was 1998, 1999. I mean, this is back when you could get on a plane without going through security. And, you know, it was a different time, right? Yeah. So it was, uh, it was amazing, you know? Um, I, I just... I mean, I can get back to you in a minute, but I don't, I don't have any, no. oh, Carl, yeah, band stories. Uh, Tokyo, because they mentioned Eric. When I was on that gig with you, you, me. Eric and Hiroshima? Yeah. <laughs> Carl, you hit one of the best Gs I've ever heard in my life at the beginning of Birdland. And Eric turned to you on the video. You know, you just, you weren't playing lead, but you just that G, almost like, yeah, I used to play that G for started. some reason when I was with Scott. It was with Scott and you, right? You, me, and Scott. Yeah. 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 I remember Scott was like, for a while, he was like, I want you to play the Gs on these. And so I would play. And I remember Eric coming up and slapping me and almost slapping me off the bandstand. Oh, my God. Yeah, Scott was having some problem with a uh, health, minor health issue, I remember. Yeah, it was only G his Gs weren't slotting. His A's and double C's were killing. 
but his G's weren't slotting. So like if it was a G and I could jump on, we'd switch. But you know, I gotta tell you the here, here, my favorite. Well, thank you for that. That was very nice. But Eric comes down and he plays, you know, Maynard's uh, crazy blowing. Yeah. He's killing it. And, like and Maynard goes, Maynard, yeah, yeah. He's doing his thing. And uh, you know, we're in Tokyo and, and Maynard goes, and uh, Eric, here, Hiroshima. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I'm sorry, Eric. I told you that story when we were, and all of us, I was talking to Tom Garling last night. All of us were like, did he really say that? And this manner, it's like, oh my God. You know? Yeah. But just I, for, for, for about two years, I was Carl Perkins, the country guy. Everybody, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, everybody had, you know, I'm sure Keith was Keith Fab from Fabla Goots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then play course. I, you know, I I really feel great about getting to play. I got to do the Thailand thing once with Maynard. You know, we did that and with the King, and I remember like the um, Thailand. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, I did it once, and I remember every even after I left the band, Maynard had um the white suit. I remember that he wore. He always wear because I remember I got a suit. I got some suits in Thailand, and I came back and told Maynard about it. And then he got he got some suits. He got. A Were you the guy that instigated? Because I remember we I, all I got am, suits. I am. I remember, and I remember. Mac, Mike MacArthur, when we went and got fitted for the suits, I brought Mac and some other guys. And one of the guys was fitting the suits, goes to Mac. He goes, Oh, good living. Like, you know, kind of like <laughs> Mac goes, Okay, you just lost some business. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, yeah, man. You know, we all so, get threads. All, all great memories, man. Just, cool. you know, the German tour for two weeks. Cause I did it. I don't know how long Keith was on, but I was on for almost a year and a half. But when I was on the band, Carl, you know, I don't know how much Maynard, if the tours were as intense uh, in the later, t you know, in Dude, 2000. When I first joined, you, you guys, you had, and Ed will tell you, I, I had a walk in the park. But when I first joined, we were gone, you know, close to 10 months a year. And Whoa. Europe, we were gone, you know, I remember we did a three-month tour in Europe with like maybe three days off. And three Ed, months? Yeah. I mean, it was a three. And so before that, Ed would say, you know, we were out for four months, five months, you know. So, yeah. And throughout the years, he got older, it got a lot more, you know, yeah. uh, amicable. But, yeah, I mean, he was a road dog. You guys know that. He wanted to go out and play. Yeah. Well, I the remember, band wasn't making money, you know. I remember when we finished the tour right before Christmas in Germany in 98. And I was, you know, when you're exhausted, you're exhausted, but it was a good kind of exhausted. It's like after you run a marathon. And yeah. I said, I remember going to get paid from Ed at the end of the tour in Germany. We played every night after two, after three months in America, two weeks at Ronnie Scott's. And then we went two weeks in Switzerland and Germany and we played almost every night. They yeah. had me and her playing like six nights in a row. Yeah. And I remember at the end of that tour, I told Ed, I said, man, I said, I don't know if I could do another week as much as I love it. And Ed, I remember Ed saying to me, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but he said, this is one of the most grueling tours we've ever done. It was great. But I mean, we were playing every night. Because of G Gabby Kleinschmidt, who did the Europe. Gabby your, Kleinschmidt. Your, 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 the German man, things. I remember yeah. thinking to myself, man, this is what you practice for all these years. You know, and yeah. you're one of the lucky guys to be out here. A lot of guys would love to be in your shoes. So I just count on my blessings, man. And then we came home for Christmas and I did a New Year's gig. We actually did a New Year's gig in um, in Des Moines, Iowa at a casino. And I guess Maynard didn't do many New Year's gigs. So um, and it turned out to pay really well, man, you know? Yeah. So Jeez. I, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Go ahead. No, you didn't. No, no, that's, that, those are great memories. I'm sure I want to hear Keith's different memories because I'm sure of, of the band, I'm, I'm sure uh, you have some good, good ones of, the band interacting with Maynard and vice versa. I do. Everybody, you know, everybody on the band, we all loved Maynard. We all would have fallen on the sword for him. Um, never heard a cross word out of his mouth. I mean, you know, the band was just always there. Um, what sticks in my mind, we do, I remember Stockholm Jazz Festival. We did Stockholm Jazz Fest. You know, we did. And I, I don't, but I think Stephen, Stephen, we talked about this today. We found something that we're going to put out. Is that the Stockholm Festival that wasn't put out, Stephen? Really? Yeah, I I have I have some footage um, of of that. Um, that gig. So, Keith. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that hasn't been out, and and we found yeah yeah. So yeah, it's funny you bring that up. That was uh one with the boats with the guy who took us for the boat ride. 
yeah and saw the what the castle and all that with the king and yeah i mean crazy stuff what do we call him sven or whatever his name was yes yeah, swim swim the <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I remember looking out from the stage and i could not see the end of the crowd yeah it, it was like forever you know and just amazing and then we were told um if i was hanging out with stockton and a couple other guys and they're like look if you're gonna go walk around go take those manor t-shirts off because you get mobbed yeah. you know we had to go back to the hotel take the manor jackets off take the sweat t-shirts off and you know put regular clothes on <laughs> wow man that was a that was a special that was a special very special festival we did yeah yeah and he played his tail off that night. <sighs> man you know, it's funny you should say Stockholm Jazz Festival because my 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 father is 100% Swedish and it was right before I left the band and all my family came out in Stockholm, all my relatives. It was really amazing. And Larry Foyan was playing with Ray Charles Band and we didn't close, you know, Maynard's Band always closed the festival, but we played and then Ray played afterwards. And and uh, and I even saved the, uh, yeah, you probably can't see it. There's the, from the- Oh, wow, yeah. Stockholm paper and Maynard picture of Maynard right there. You can see it. Wow. You know? Yeah. So it was, it was, it was really well. It was right before I left the band. So. Oh, beautiful. You know, Frankie, yeah. you brought up something yesterday and you sent the picture, unfortunately with the tech issues, um, we couldn't put it up because, uh, restream and what have you, but one Portland. of the Portland, uh, which is my last gig, but I also remember you brought up a thing. Uh, my, my last gig in 98, uh, I decided to move back to New York and play Broadway um, at that time and settle down. I was trying to settle down. That lasted about a year, and I was back out on the road. But um, uh, but I remember specifically, you know, a lot of the old band left. So we finished Brass Attitude. Uh, Frank Green, uh, Tom Garling, um, the sax chair opened up. Matt Wallace was gone. Um, Chris Farr was gone. It was a lot of a lot of new guys. You know, um, whole band know. turned over when I was there. Yeah. And you came out. I had Mike Brevin. I had Adolf, Adolfo, yourself, uh, Mike, Mike Brevin. I had Jeff Rupert. I hired from Florida. He played. He what played a dinner. monster player he that guy! Great. Is. He's still a great player, a great teacher. I I love Jeff. I'll never forget the first day Jeff joined the band, and I'm looking at him. Well, it was the day that you were on there. That was the first yeah. day you were there. That summer. Well, he came on in the summer because okay. Matt was my roommate. Matt Wallace. Okay, yeah, that's roommate. right. I'm sorry. But I remember the first night. I'll never forget this. You talk about confidence. I remember <laughs> Jeff wanted to play a solo on Caravan. He'd never played a solo on the band, and he walks up to shake Maynard's hand before his solo. And it's like he'd been on the band for 10 years and he just tore it up. And I just go, man, this dude's really well, he, good. He deals, yeah, he's a great player. He deals. He's a super nice players. guy. I mean, he's a monster player, man. Well, I remember everybody leaving and, you know, Jeff coming on, who's monster and Mike Brevin on trombone. Sub, you know, he's jumped in yeah. Tom Garling's chair. And, you know, Adolfo, uh, Frank Green left. So Adolfo was fresh out of North Texas before Tower of Power. Um, right. And I remember, dude, I remember it's like, you know, I was the MD and we were opening with Diana. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Right. So we did Diana's music and, and we and to make it even more difficult, we did the King Cat Theater right. um, video that night. Right. So it was Diane Shore and, you know, all my guys were gone. So I was MD and, was, you know, it was I learned a lot and it was really it really helped me out in the future and with other bands with responsibility as far as rehearsing. But I remember the way you guys came into it and the new guys specifically um, Adolfo, yourself, and you, you were on a band for a little bit before that. Half but, a year. I've been on almost a half year. Yeah. But you were, that was, that was in the beginning now. Right. Right. So you, right. Were, yeah. 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 So, but meaning that a whole bunch of new guys on the band, and here right. we are, and everybody stepped up to the plate because we had to read Diane's can, music. We had one rehearsal. Like, for yeah. Her. In the back of the theater and everybody's right. dealing and playing and, and coming up with, and actually I'm very, I was, you know, to this day, I'm like, everybody steps up because the man in front steps up. If you don't, right. if, you know, he leads by example, the crew, you know, Mike Freeland, Bruce Galloway, of course, as Sarge, everybody is just dealing on such a high level. It, they bring you up to their level, you know? And so, yeah. you know, it was a, you know, Carl, a really I gotta positive. say, when, you're right, man. When I came on the band, I was like trying, you know, certain notes were like kind of there, but hearing Maynard and hearing you and Frank Green and all those other guys, I mean, I can only speak for myself. My playing and my chops just kept getting better and better when I was on the band, just because I was hearing, you know, sure. you're around great. Everybody. It can't help but raise your game, man. 
Keith, you I know? mean, part, part, part of the things I loved about Keith, too, is, you know, Frank, you said it your best. Everybody in, improved. And Keith, man, I remember periods of Keith, it would be like shooting up like freaking – you know, vertical man, not, not not like you know slow. I mean, just his, his his concept would just shoot up tremendously. We'd all have our plateaus, but I right. remember Keith, man, you were like very. Um, it seems like a very growing time for you musically. It was a time that I needed. Um, I needed to know what the real world looked like instead <laughs> of just kind of with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it was a blessing. So, of course, being around you and being around Boss and and, and the, the rhythm section we had was killing. Oh, that was a killing rhythm section. So, yeah, what a time. <laughs> yeah, we we could go on and on with these stories. I love it, man. Thank thank you for telling us about them. Uh, we have any fish head comments or, or questions before we start wrapping this up? Because we could go to like one o'clock and, you know, yeah, that, right? would be, that, would, that would be, you know, good but bad. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, had a couple, a uh, couple of interesting s stories. First of all, we had somebody, uh, let us, <laughs> we had somebody let us know that the, uh, the espresso restaurant was called little Italy Soho across the street from, uh, Ronnie Scott's. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I remember that. Yeah. Um, also we have, uh, James is, uh, is telling a story, um, Keith and Ed were um, at a at a club. Uh, it was a sorry. I'm trying to find the first message. There was three of them. Uh, went to a gig at the great club Zanzibar. Um, Keith was working at that time. Um, mm -hmm. Ed comes out and asks me afterwards, "Hey, can you take the boss back to the hotel?" I had a box full of clothes and a vacuum in my van. And I was like, I might never get this opportunity again. So I took Keith, Ed, and, and, uh, and Maynard back to the, uh, back to the hotel in this van. <laughs> never forgot how nice you guys were. Um, so a nice little story from James there, but, um, I got, I got a couple different questions that are kind of all similar. So I'll throw them to you guys all at once and you guys can each give your own answers. Um, they come from Gamma, Johan and OCL. So the question is, is from your guys' time with Maynard, what was, what was something not related to high notes that you guys really dug about his playing? And what was something other than range related stuff that you guys picked up for yourselves as performers from me? I mean, sound, if you don't have sound core in your sound, you know, and musicality, nobody cares how high or fast or loud you play. I mean, you know, and that's what I was taught before that. And Maynard, listen, anything Maynard ever did, especially the really old stuff, man, it was like those really old things of Maynard from the fifties and sixties. He didn't play a high note for the first five minutes. It was just like sound, man, you know, mm -hmm. and feel and, and right. Yeah, man. Yeah, Keith, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I think um, one of the things that impressed me when I got on the band and got to hear him night after night was his approach to the music itself. Um, how musical he would play. Like, for instance, when he did Caruso, how, because he told me personally that his favorite thing to listen to or the favorite people to listen to were opera singers. And mm -hmm. so just the lyricism, no matter what range he was at, just the lyricism. And then his improvisation was very lyrical. So yeah. just, just the lyrical approach that he always took. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was like Pavarotti on the trumpet, man, you know? Uh, yeah. You no know. one could play it. I'm sorry, but no one to this day. I don't think no one, period, period. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an asshole, Long Island, Brooklyn <laughs> asshole right now. No one could play a ballad like freaking Maynard Ferguson, nope. period, the end. You know, Sorry. Carl, funny you should say that Sorry. it is memorial service. It is memorial service, which was just, uh, you know, transcendent. I mean, it was surreal. And I, I, I remember him playing darn that, you know, that darn that dream. They streamed it on the screen. And I thought, man, I don't remember. I've never heard this before. And I didn't realize it had just been recorded. It's yeah. one of the last things he played. And it was just absolutely beautiful. You know, to play a ballad like him. And I'll be honest with you, you know, in his clinics that we all been at, and uh, if you can't play romantically in the upper register, bring it down a third. 
and then p- bring it up a step and then bring it up a, th- a third until it's romantic when it sounds four stop and it's the Pavarotti thing and I'm, you know his his improvisation his technique was great but you know he's going back to the old school of Dexter Gordon and these guys that knew the words knew what the intent was knew yeah. knowing the flow of the song like you guys touched on which is wonderful the musicality he had all that rolled up into one man it was just like when he slowed things down you really got to hear it it was like oh my god yeah I actually heard, i actually heard something really interesting today that kind of supports what you guys are saying i had never heard this before but uh he played for an italian movie and it was a it was a tune uh it was called i uh, know I'll, I'll pronounce it wrong but uh totally detesta okay and i just found a, a version of it on youtube and i'll i'll share it in the chat and I'm, I, I kept waiting for it and I kept waiting for it and I kept waiting for him to do like the Maynard fireworks and it never came. Wow. But the whole thing from start to, to start to end was just vintage Maynard lyrical, you know, melodic. Uh, it was, it was everything that you guys are talking about, you know, just without the double C's, you know, <laughs> and, but it, it lacked for nothing. Yeah. And it was really, really great. And I can't believe I, I've been, you know, a fan and in, involved with you guys, you know, for so long. And I, first time I ever heard this was today. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I mean, I really believe this. If Maynard, even if Maynard had, you know, continued living and could only couldn't play above a high C, he still would have been one of the greatest players in the world. Yeah. He still yeah. would have been. He still Absolutely. would have been because he said it's like it's like when I listen to Chip Baker, he says so much was with, with you know limited you know it's it, it's mm-hmm. Maynard Maynard, I mean it was great the double C's and all that but I mean Maynard the reason he was who he was is because he's he's you know you know what I'm gonna say, I mean there was so much that the high notes were just icing on the cake man there was yeah. there was really the soul and the musicianship coming through that, right you know oh absolutely you know and I'm you gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say. There's two things. Keith sent me something the other day that's not published. And I'm very proud of it because I, I've seen Keith, uh, like uh, hopefully all of us have had this in our lives, in our personal lives, in our playing. And uh, I've seen Keith really grow. And Keith uh, is coming out Friday night early, uh, Friday night for the East uh, West Coast people and Saturday morning. And you did a beautiful version uh, for Maynard's birthday of Maria. Wow. And you played so pretty, bro. Uh, of course, there's some crazy high notes, but you played Keith. For, you didn't play man. You played really pretty, and and a beautiful sound. And you know, you play really pretty. And t- tell us where we can see that and when we can get it, because uh, you should be proud. Of it. It's a view, really great collage of you uh, of, of you playing a tribute to Maynard with a beautiful Maynard picks and a video that goes along. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I'm going to publish it on YouTube, Facebook, um, both my channels on Facebook and then Instagram. Um, yeah, and it was, it was something I'd gotten a hold of the chart. Um, it's the Jay Chataway arrangement. It's the last Latin Samba type feel. Um, and again, it, it's straight off of new vintage, one of my favorite albums. Yeah, man. And so I tried to do as much justice as I could. I will, you know, none of us are Maynard. None of us ever will be, yep. but you know, it was like, Here's my tribute. You're so. doing the, you're playing it with Keith, with the energy of Maynard, but Keith Fiala, which is important. No one's going to out Maynard Maynard. No okay. one's going to out Toro, or Toro, or Toro. But, you know, you, that, that's why I really like this track is it's like there's Keith playing a nice, you know, and really pretty. And guys, check his out. What's your YouTube and, and, and Facebook to, so people can check it out over the weekend? Just under Keith Fiala. Uh, Instagram is Fiala, yes, sir. Okay. I, check it out. I will check it out. <laughs> it's Earl all the time. Check so, it out. Yeah, man. Thank you. But I appreciate that call. Thank you. Oh no, it's really great. And I'll, I'm going to say another thing too. Um, I got to hang out with Keith and his boss in um at the Blue Note, our old stomping grounds in New York. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. It was a year before the pandemic. I was in town working and had the night off and called Keith and we hung out and 
There we are hanging in the dressing room with our good friends Gary and a, a tour. Actually, a tour didn't show up, but Gary and all My our gang. good friends. Yeah, the whole gang hanging out in a tour's yeah. room. And a tour picked up a horn. And I, you have one of them there. It's a trumpet, but very dark, flugely sound. And he played the most beautiful thing. And he played maybe eight bars of it. And he stopped. I'm like, remember this? I yell. I'm like, play that again. He goes, what? I said, that's what I want to hear. And he played his most lyric. It had no, it, it was just such a beautiful melodic sound. And and I said to Tor, "That's what I came to hear." And and that second set, he did a lot of that. It was, and and I I know, you know, people want to hear fireworks, and that's great. We all have our egos, and we all feed into that, and it's a wonderful thing. But it's not just the high note jock. And that's what is around a lot of these days now is the high note jocks. Play as much music as you play high notes, and then you'll be dealing with some things. And the, Frank, you said it best, play pretty. People want to hear your yeah. sound. And Otoro's doing that. Keith, you're doing that. Frank, you do, you're doing it, and we're talking about it. Steven does. It's very important that the younger generation realize that there's a lot of beauty in a lot of different things. It's not just loud, fast, and high. Yeah. If you don't sound good between low C and high C, man, nothing else really matters. You yeah, know, I don't think. And that's what my teacher, Bill Adam, kind of instilled in me. And it's, 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 you know, it's great the range from, you know, you know, it's just, you got to have a nice sound in yeah. that one octave, two octaves. Yeah. You can't think think people hear your sound. I'm sorry, Keith. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't take the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> you really can't because no. you have crappy sound. No one's going to hear you at all. No. First thing people like hear is your singer. Sound. Who wants to hear a singer with a four octave range? It's, ah! you know, <laughs> who wants to hear that? <laughs> Steven knows, not me. Yeah, yeah. You're, I, you're have right, Frank, I, I have a thing for chick. I have a, I have a thing for chick singers range. that <laughs> doesn't work. For me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. Well, you guys yeah. answered that. Uh, any more questions from the fish heads? If not, I'm sure there's yeah. one or two more. Yeah, hit, hit us with a few more. And then you guys hanging in? Over oh, here? man, I love it. Carl, this is wonderful, man. Thank you so cool. much. Hey, I got well, one from Mike, uh, from Michael Del Quattro, is asking, when the hell would you guys warm up when you were on the valet gig before you had to play? He says, in the morning. He says, I, <laughs> he says I, I took a lesson from a former MF lead player who I won't name, and he got all on him about warming up. Like it was a weakness. Keith, you go first, uh, and then and then I will go. But you go ahead. It, at the point that I was in a band, my first concern was Maynard, and so I would I would do catch as catch can. Um, Maynard actually told me to start buzzing my mouthpiece, so I started carrying it with me, um, and that's the one way that I would warm up because he he told me a story that you know he was he had this reputation when he was younger where he was doing night after night after night after night of the guy just walking in, pulling out the horn, slapping the mouthpiece in and playing. He said, what they didn't realize is I lived an hour and a half away and I'd buzz my mouthpiece for an hour and a half until I got to the gig. Yep. And right. so, you know, that, that always stuck with me. And so that's what I did. Yeah. When you mention mouthpiece, there's a, you asked about band stories, Carl. I got to preface it by saying this. I will never forget one or two times being in a cab with Maynard on the way to the gig. And Maynard hadn't had the time to warm up yet because we were in a hurry for whatever reason. And there was one time I remember, I don't know where it was, but I was in back and Maynard was in front and he took his mouthpiece out and went to buzz it and forgot to warn the cab driver. And he apologized after the guy almost had a heart attack, you know. And he, yeah. The guy's like, oh. And then goes, oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, he had to tell him we were on our way to a club. But you know what? I the, the the system I learned on is really wonderful. The whole Bill Adam thing, but all the Arbins and Schlossberg and Clark. But man, that stuff doesn't travel well when you're on the road a lot of times, you know, yeah. to do a three hour warm up. And the year before I went with Maynard's band, I had the good fortune of playing with my friend Daryl Exity, who was uh, best friends with Jim Manley. And during that year, I didn't know it at the time, but I was like kind of learning a way to get get my chops ready a lot sooner with a combination of mouthpiece. I wasn't lip buzzing yet, but mouthpiece, carrying the mouthpiece in my pocket, the whisper mute thing. And so, you know, man, when you're when you're in the middle of London or you're in the the village in New York, you can't be playing long tones and all, you you can't do that, man. You know, so I I found a way to get my chops ready, you know, in the hotel room without disturbing people. 
Well, and it took, it was a process. It took a while to do that. I remember the first time on a, a I was on the Guy Lombardo band. First time I warmed up in a whisp, whisper mute, I went to play the first set. I was playing lead and I could barely play because my chops weren't used to that. Yeah. And I had to train myself. I had to train myself over a period of weeks and months. And I was a full-time working player before I went with Maynard. I think that's what really made me able to go on there and do it. But I had to condition myself to be able to warm up a little bit of mouthpiece, you know, a little bit of, you know, like Carl, I've even gotten your stuff. I've looked at your things. You know, we got to figure things out as we go along. We get information from teachers. All teachers give you is information, but you got to process it and make it work for yourself. Right. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I watch Scott, Scott Inglebright and, uh, look at you know uh, he do the no hands approach and play very very less pressure and, and flexibility and Maynard right. with his flexibility and doing his lip slurs which are shakes or lip slurs you know right. the, just the speed basically Maynard would say right. and so for me seeing Maynard and Scott and Joey Tartell and John Owens Frank Green you know I got to play with a lot of trumpet players in Maynard Ferguson's band which yeah over the course of 12 years for me being on on, on a band for over over 12 years uh, on and off, I got to hear a lot of great trumpet players that I idolized, Wayne Bergeron and all these gentlemen that, you know, everybody, I, I learned a lot from everybody. And one of the things that I took to the bank to, and, and really internalized for me is like, I got to figure this out efficiently, quickly. Yes. So, like you said, you, you know, you know, so I, I could, I could be ready still to this day in five minutes to play and hit, you know, five things very quickly just to get the blood flowing and get everything moving instead right. of doing a 40 minute thing and, you know, really hitting the dissection of, okay, flexibility fingers, you know, sound, long tone, and, and just making abbreviate, abbreviating. And so I actually wrote the stuff down. That was my first book that made her let me sell, which was amazing for me. So, Carl, I want to ask you, man, because you're such a great player and you are too, Keith. You're both great players, but I don't ask you, Carl. I mean, I, I'm all, it's taken me years to realize a warm up is not a routine and a routine is not a warm up. You know, I, I can warm up in 10, 15 minutes, but I want to ask both of you guys do you have, after you warmed up, do you have routines that you do every day right now? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of do. Yeah, no, I'm, if you don't have a routine the way I look at it, you know, it's still, as Maynard said, you're a bodybuilder. You yeah, know, you have Trump to. is a body. But you're conditioning your muscles facially, diaphragmically, right. even your back. You know, you know. How many times did you guys see this as he's walking on stage before Maynard's walking on stage? And the... right, just, exactly. Know, just open it up his back and like you know. And yeah. the older I get, man, it's crazy. I I really you know. So yeah, I'm a routine guy, man. Like for instance, I am too. I'm at five in the morning. I'm getting in the car. I'm driving two and a half hours across the state. I'm, I'm, I'll be playing at six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning at Terry Warburton's. We're doing some CF Horn stuff, and I've been doing my, 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 my routine, just weightlifting, you know, for forty five minutes to an hour before I play any music, just so I know my stuff is happening. So I'm like, okay, this is good, and then I could play music in here. That's so, about how yeah. long it takes me to with rests, about forty five minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But not and, on a playing day, you know, that's just a routine right. before I start really playing music. Right. But, you know, try, you know, Bobby Shue said it best. You should be able to also try to pull some things together here really quickly, too, because we all know you show up to the gig sometimes. Yeah. What if you have eight this. o'clock in the morning sessions? What are you going to do? Get up at 5 a.m. and play for two and a half hours? You know, I remember seeing something. I don't know Simon Gardner that well, but we're Facebook friends. And he put something up on the Internet recently that he had to play a session at like nine in the morning. And it was like really crazy. Oh. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking, holy cow, man, you know, and I'm sure he nailed it. But I was just thinking, you know, I know I've heard the, the stories about Chuck Finley. G- Jerry Hay would say Chuck would show up, you know, with a session with Gary Grant, and Jerry Hay. And he, he said Chuck would show up at night, you know, eight in the morning. His hair, you could tell he'd been in the shower. His hair was all wet. He put the mouthpiece in. He said it doesn't matter. The first note was a high F. It was just like it was right there. But, you know, he's he's legendary, right? Absolutely. So, um, uh-huh. yeah. Chuck was always like one of my main, you know, heroes, you know, growing up and. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, do you have that? I mean, cause you're doing a lot of logistics, Keith. I, I, I imagine when you're playing and, and when you're not playing, sometimes you guys are showing up from the airport right to the gig with a Toro. So does, uh, does, does uh, the man have, how's he deal with that? I'm sure. Great. 
He does. Um, we we have lead pipes that Mike Del Cuadro gave us. Um, and then Arturo has his sandal valves, which is a great tool. I'm got <laughs> I got to get one, man. I've really got to get one. I know I've been thinking about it. Because basically they, they make no noise. And so he's always doing the fingers, you know, the, the basically the Clark drills. Um, and then buzzing on the lead pipe or buzzing on the, the actual pipe. There you go. The prototype. Wow. The prototype. Wow, Carl, I got to get one, man. I've been meaning to get Listen one. Listen to the noise this thing makes. I, it's bad, man. This, the, you know, I've had, you had that? The first, you had that? This was one of the first uh, pushes that Frankie V put out. And so it's it's crude. I want to get a new one. But I'll tell you what, it's great. Oh, that and the, the Pete for me, this and the Pete, Terry's Pete thing yeah. really helped me out. But I'm oh, sorry. Wow. I mean, that's basically, you know, on the road, if, if I can't get the horn out and I can't put a mute in and play a little bit, I use that. Yeah. Wow. Killer Frank, you should check him out. No, I, I will. It's amazing. There's some, th yeah, no. Man, Keith, every time you and Arturo come through town, man, I'm always blown away. Arturo's one of those guys, there are like some people that, you know, they're getting older, but they just keep getting better and better. And Arturo's, you know, it's a true artist, man. Yeah. It's like Maynard at the very end, man. Maynard, Maynard, right up to before he died, he was just playing incredible. You know, Arturo, Arturo never ceases to amaze me at all. In oh, fact, man. two days ago, I talked to Gary Grant, and Gary was telling me the story about when Maynard and Wayne were recording. They recorded in Santa Barbara. Yeah. For the Maynard Sound Band. Design Studios with Dominic. Yeah. Yep. And Gary said, you know, Maynard hadn't played in three or four weeks. He was kind of sick, um, but he came in and he killed it. And it's like, yeah. you know, and Gary Grant, of all people, the legendary Gary Grant is telling me. He is about, amazing. I'm blown away. I'm blown away by what this man could do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 the same way. Arturo just, the guy is music from the word go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One of the I nicest mean, we're, things. We're lucky, heard. man. We're lucky. We're lucky we got to be around these people, man. I'm, you know, honored to be here tonight. Just, I'm learning a lot right now. Thanks, man. All right, what are you saying, Carl? Um, I was 18 or 17 or 18 playing an after hours jam session and a Toro came into the room and the room was probably the size of my office, small room. And a Toro came in, I decided to play everything loud, fast and high as I could. <laughs> and and a Toro, I got done and it wasn't that good. It wasn't good at all. And he clapped and he came over and put his arm around me. He goes, you need to play to the room. Don't let the room play to you. He said, <laughs> I said, and I took, I was young. I'm like, huh? He goes, always play to the crowd. He goes, they don't want to hear high notes in a small room. Wow. And it stuck with, it stuck with me. I'm like, very musical. And this is, you know, I'm 49 now. I was 17 or 18 and it stuck with me. I'm like, always play to the room. Wow. You know, I, and I was like, wow, man. You know, that's when I knew, you know, the guy is dealing with some different things. And, I didn't know then. I mean, it took me a minute to figure out what he was. Yeah. I'm I love Arturo's story about Dizzy when he met Dizzy in Cuba. I love that, you know, when it, Dizzy, when he took, you know, and he showed Dizzy around. And then that night, Dizzy heard him play in a club and was like, whoa, man, this, you know. Yeah. Hey, Carl, before we're done, I want you to, I had the honor of meeting your dad a few times. Yeah. I want you to talk about your dad a little bit because I know your dad was a great trumpet player. I remember meeting your dad down in Florida. I know you really miss him. You know, oh, such thanks, a nice man. guy, man. I yeah, just lost my dad. Um, my, my I just lost my the... dad in October. He was ninety-seven. Oh. You know, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. Ninety-seven. He had a good life. He did. Yeah. Tell me yeah. about your dad, man. I'll what tell you about that? my dad. There he is. He's on my desk. Him and Maynard, and and my dad and Main, uh, myself and Maynard at the Blue Note. That sits on my desk, um, in front of me here. That's uh, my old man in Maine, and him. My dad, it was my idol, my first idol, and still to me to this day is my idol. He um, auditioned for Maynard Birdland Dreamland Band in the 50s um, when Nicky Travis got the gig, who was the lead trumpet player, who was also playing on NBC at the time. My wow. dad was playing lead with Tito Puente, and he had my brother, who's nine years older than me, um, decide that he would like health insurance and a uh, steady gig and decide he was going to drive a sanitation truck. So Nikki wow. Travis and all these guys were in uh, in Manhattan getting ready, to, you know, Birdland Dream Band opening up and, and and doing double bill with Miles Davis, and he heard Nikki Travis going in audition, and totally kill it, and he put his horn back in the case and left. Wow. 
Wow. But six months later, he's going to the Birdland every night after his gigs with Tito and everything. He's still playing on weekends and driving a garbage truck. And long story short, you know, my dad started hanging and having a couple of drinks with Maynard. And Maynard and him had a relationship to where, you know, they knew each other and they were friendly. And, you know, long story short, my dad was my idol. Um, 58. Here's his 59. Uh, he bought it in 58. I bought it in 59. It's a 58 Constellation. That's his yeah. horn. He bought this horn because Maynard was playing it in Birdland. Wow. Yeah, you know, which incidentally, I have one of those horns at 61. Yeah. I have Maynard's horn behind me. But long story short about the con and everything is my dad was married um, to another woman, not my mom. And he had a picture hanging at Birdland um, with himself the girl in the middle and him on the end and he got divorced he came back and got divorced he got the woman got cut out of it fast forward at 30 years ed Sargent's the valet on a band and i come in i'm you know i'm like 12 13 years old i come in with this picture with this woman cut out in the middle and it says maynard ferguson um charlie to charlie maynard ferguson and so maynard sees it and realizes this is the guy I used to hang out with birdland Wow. And starts laughing and Ed sees the picture and it's his ex-wife, um, you know, and so like they kind of hit it off again. So they really had a nice kinship. And when I got Maynard's gig, my dad was so proud and he was just such such an idol to me. This Ed Sargent and Maynard gave me this picture. Wow. My fiance at the time was here and she's cut out and Maynard did the same thing. Maynard Ferguson points to the fiance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my dad was a big part of my whole upbringing with Maynard. Man, I'm so and, glad I asked and, that. I, you know, because I met your dad a few times, man. I know he was so proud of you. And, nice, man, man. You know, yeah, I'm very lucky. I think he's down in Florida when we played in Florida. Yeah, and I know yeah. he's been gone, what, five years now? Four man, years? Man, you got a good memory. He's been gone four years. My mom's still alive, and she was very vocal in, in, in my practicing, too. And, you know, my dad was the fun. My mom was like, you need to practice, son. So right. the two of them were great. I couldn't have had a better upbringing with them, Beautiful, and I was man. very fortunate. And, you know, Keith, Keith, and I know you do it, and I know, Frank, you do it. With students, you guys inspire young and old people. And yeah do it you guys are doing it and keep on doing it because it goes i see it man and you guys are doing such a good job of yeah paying it forward man. you know Tell carl i i, I sometimes forward. wonder yeah and what you're saying everything is true imagine if 50 years from now this is a, is a really crazy question but imagine 50 years from now we don't want this to happen all the music that we love if nobody knew about it anymore or cared about it oh, that's be, scary that's we don't want that it would never happen i no. got it it's some, of these, some of these books that I work with in these kids are really, I mean, these kids are playing Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. And then they get into jazz kind of things too. And it's really cool, man. You know, so these, you have kids, you know, they're probably not going to go on and make a living playing. I mean, where would they play? But their, their ears and their brains are opened up to other, to appreciate other stuff than, you know, whatever they're going to hear if they never had studied music. Right. Beautiful, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. And I never got into teaching till I was close to 50 years old. So I never did it when, so I'm glad I got into teaching when I was a bit older and experienced. So I really appreciate it more. Yeah. Man, I have a kid who's 11 years old. And I think she, you're not going to believe this, Carl and Keith. She's 11 years old. This kid has a huge sound. She's playing up, not like it matters, but she can squeak out a high C. She just started playing a few months ago. Like when she plays hot cross buns or Mary had a little lamb. I say, now play it. I showed her how to play it up an octave. I think, might, I think they're listening right now. I mean, that's crazy, you know? Nice. And she's playing stuff by ear. So, you know, nice. I think in another year, she's going to be better than me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Isn't that something? Yeah, before, that's great, man. 11-year-old girl, yeah. Just before we go, I got to say this, that Please. I'm, I'm lucky because I met Arturo through Maynard. Yep. Um and I, I found out more about Arturo through Maynard before I even got to meet him because Maynard told me the story about 77 when he was in New York, he went to hear Arturo. They were, they were warming up and, you know, doing sound check and whatnot. And he was so fascinated by Arturo and so impressed that what basically what Maynard told me was that this, this trumpet was like taped together and he didn't even know how he could make a sound out of it. Wow. Felt endeared and he gave him his horn. 
Well, wow. then, you know, cycling forward several years, getting to be with Arturo and asking Arturo about that whole thing. Arturo holds a lot of uh, fond memories of our, uh, of Maynard and just sure. what a wonderful guy he was. And he will never forget that horn and that whole gesture. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just what a beautiful cycle to see it from one side and then hearing it from the other and just seeing the mutual respect and love that those guys had for each other. And there yeah. it is. It's the love and mutual respect that we need, especially exactly. now more than ever. Yeah, more than ever. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. you know yeah. there's a there's a thing called Positive Trumpet Players Forum, and that's cool. It's got a great name and there's a lot of positive people on it. Let's stay positive, like 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 you know Doc Severinsen and Maynard and Louis Armstrong and Dizzy Gillespie. There'll be some darkness, but let's stay let's stay positive, man. I mean, because yeah. we have to. Well, I can only say for myself. I can never say about myself. I can say, well, man, I never got a break. I mean, I've been very blessed. You know, if I never play another gig, the people I got to be around, including you guys, Keith, you and I ever play together. But I mean, we know each other. So I mean, I've been very, very fortunate. You know, and there's other guys that, you know, there's some great players that never, you know, got breaks and there's not going to be, there's probably not going to be when this COVID thing's over, you know, I hope it gets back to what it was before, you know, it might and it might not. I'm hopeful that it will, you know, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very thankful, you know, and really honored Carl, you'd ask me to be a part of this tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Likewise, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And that's the one thing about Maynard I'll always never forget is how the band intros, he would take all that time to introduce the band. And in your hometown, like I remember the first time, and you were there, Carl, the first time we played in my hometown and Mary was here visiting over and he'd wait in your hometown. He'd introduce you last to make a big fuss over you. It's like, man, who else does that? I've never played with anyone that does that. Nobody. No. 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 So there you go. Enough said. No, I think we hit. I think we hit it, and I can't tell you what a. You guys brought back a lot of fond memories, um, and uh, you know I know for a fact that Maynard really, really adored both you guys. And uh, thank you. You know, uh, I do too. So I appreciate you guys hanging, um, and I gotta say. I think we all need to give a debt of gratitude not only to Maynard but also to our friend Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> Duct tape together. Yeah, made it happen keeping tonight, us, man. Yeah, wow. keeping us together. Hey, bro, thank you for 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 for, for hanging with us and uh, making everything a Swiss Army. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got I got the Phillips head now. I'm, I'm getting I'm going in deep now. <laughs> no, but uh, but thank you guys. Thank for everybody in the chat. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I know more people are gonna be able to watch this on the replay that didn't get the new links. Um, so um, I'm I'm confident that that people will be able to 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 check in so i appreciate you guys' time and uh you know with that being said i'll uh i'll let carl have the the last word and we'll uh we'll sign things off for the night two hours and 10 minutes in thanks steven <laughs> yes sir yeah, thanks guys i don't think there's much left to say then Thank you, gentlemen. I'm honored to have you guys here. I, I would normally end it with a question, but man, we hit we hit so many great things. Um, let's just leave it with Maynard's going to be. He would have been 93 come May 4th, Tuesday. Right. Um, he brought us together again. He's bringing right. all our friends together again. Right. Uh, community, community together again, and I can't wait to see your 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 tune. Uh, come out saturday keith and i can't wait to hang out and and play with you and and and, and turn out some great students playing high seas frank so hey carl i must say one more thing man before we just sign off i remember of right before maynard turned 70 i i would loaded him in we were right night before the blue note and you were there and i had him all this stuff set up in the washington square hotel and and i go okay maynard good night and he goes no stay here he goes Flo is gonna show up and i and Flo showed up and uh we i had champagne i tried to leave and maynard said no man stay here for a while (laughs) and i i just think man that was amazing you know so thanks again man that's all good bro i you know i I don't even know what to say it's just it's just positivity and uh you know here's here here's to you guys and here's to maynard thank you have a good night good night guys